Thank you very much for the invitation, um, and especially to the Kenyan Institute, and especially to Mandy Turner, the director of the Kenyan Institute, who just um, spoke. Um, there is an enormous amount of work that goes into organizing the very simple, uh, apparently very simple um, turning up, me turning up to talk to you. The, uh, you wouldn't believe how much work has gone into uh, making this event that's happening right now actually happen. I'm going to be talking about um, what's happening in global governance, global economic and financial governance. So um, I have to confess I've never been in Palestine or indeed in the Levant, if I am a use, allowed to use that word uh, in these days. I've never been in this part of the world um, before. So I'm not going to talk about the Palestinian situation. Um, I hope that, um, that you, although you are caught up into this dreadful situation, um, are nevertheless interested in what's happening in the world at large, because um, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. And I'm actually going to begin by talking about three uh, big current international negotiations that are going on right now. Um, uh, the first one, a set of trade negotiations. Second one, about climate change. And the third one, about the mil Millennium Development Goals, or rather what should replace the Millennium Development Goals when they finish in 2015. So three major uh, sets of negotiations going on which will shape geoeconomics and geopolitics for decades to come on a world scale, including in this part of the world. And all of these negotiations test the commitment of the US, of the West, and in, in a sense of the whole world to broad multilateralism. Um, they give, they raise the question of how much importance does the US, does the West, does the world give to um, mutual interests between countries in multilateral agreements? Because insofar as there is little mutual interest in multilateral agreements, that is, rule, general rules applying to large numbers of countries, insofar as there's not much interest in that, the alternative to broad multilateralism is bilateralism or mini-lateral agreements involving just small numbers of countries. And the danger with bilateral ag agreements or mini-lateral agreements is that you end up with competing blocks of countries uh, rather than a broad international community, competing blocks of countries like in Europe, for example, in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, competing blocks which then gave rise to lots and lots of conflicts between countries. So there, is, there are very major issues at stake in these negotiations. I'm going to talk about uh, the trade negotiations uh, rather than the climate change or the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals negotiations. And there are two in particular that are huge in terms of affecting the whole future of the world economy. The first one is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, and that is the negotiations involving the US and a whole lot of East Asian countries, with one major exception, which I'll come to. The second one is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. It's abbreviated TTIP, so you hear people speaking TTIP. That's um, a transatlantic trade and investment partnership, and that again involves the US and the EU countries uh, reach, uh, negotiating about trade and investment flows between them. And then there's a third set involving the EU negotiating with Japan and the EU negotiating with India. And then a fourth set, negotiations between the US and the EU and on the one hand, and many developing countries on the other, about trade, specifically about trade in services. 
So these are the four sets of negotiations. We talk of the negotiations as being between states. So we talk of the US negotiating with Europe or the US negotiating with East Asia. But remember, behind these uh, labels for states, the US, there are very strong corporate interests, that is business interests. Trade unions, for example, have no involvement in these negotiations. These uh, negotiations are driven by business interests. So it's not just the US and Europe, it's US corporations and European corporations. The significance of these um, trade negotiations is, is very great. What they signify is a, a, re a retreat, a moving away by the US and by Europe from grand multilateralism, which was a sort of general principle of economic and financial uh, agreements in the post-Second World War decades. The West is moving away from general multilateralism and is instead moving towards what you could call out, what, what, you, what you could call opt-out or opt-in multilateralism or multilateralism a la carte. That is, um, the, the US and European countries are sort of choosing very particularly what agreements they want to do multilaterally and what agreements they want to do bilaterally. Um, and especially this is true in the US, of the US. The US, despite all these foreign policy disasters of the US, like in Afghanistan, like in, uh, in Iraq, despite all these things, and also despite the NSA revelations from Edward Snowden and so on and so on, the US is reasserting very strongly, we are number one and we will conduct negotiations bilaterally with particular countries because in bilateral negotiations we have the stronger hand. You have to agree to what we want. I'm obviously exaggerating this, but it's, there's real truth behind that exaggeration. The US is reasserting itself as number one. And you see this in, particularly in terms of these two negotiations that the US is at, is at the center of. The US is, I mean, these agreements um, are in effect undermining many countries' existing national legislation on things like health and food safety and environment. For example, the uh, negotiations uh, will help um, tobacco companies uh, get their goods, their cigarettes, into Thailand, even though the Thai government wishes to restrict tobacco imports for public health reasons, the uh, agreements that are being negotiated under the TTP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, will require the Thai government to have open access to the cigarettes supplied by R.J. Reynolds or other big tobacco companies. That's an example of what I mean by saying that these agreements undermine many countries' existing national le legislation. Um, and in addition, U.S. negotiators in both agreements are pushing for stronger patent protection um, uh, con and also constraints on what national governments can do in terms of public procurements, that is to make it more difficult for national governments to give public procurement contracts to domestic firms rather than to foreign firms. Um, so, quite um, strong constraints on national governments are coming through these big trade negotiations. Another problem with the negotiations uh, is that they, re or the agreements, that is that they require what is called investor state arbitration. And what that means, investor state arbitration means, is that it allows corporations like American or European corporations to sue states for domestic regulations which hurt the profits of those corporations. For example, the case that I just mentioned, R.J. Reynolds, the great big tobacco company, can sue the Thai government for putting on restrictions on imports of cigarettes um, which hurt the profits 
of R.J. Reynolds, even though the Thai government wishes to restrict uh, tobacco imports. But um, um, it's possible for the tobacco company to sue the Thai government under this uh, uh, arrangement. And what's more, the cases are brought in secret tribunals which are outside the legal jurisdiction of affected countries. So, in effect, these rules that are written into these trade agreements that are being negotiated right now give corporations immunity from the sovereignty of governments on many issues. Well, you can see that these uh, trade agreements are having, will have very far-reaching consequences. I mentioned that the TTIP, sorry, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, TTP, uh, trade negotiations are about the US and East Asian countries but that they exclude one very important country that is they exclude China and from the Chinese perspective this trade negotiation is a way by which the US uh, binds in bring, draws in countries that are around China that encircle China more closely to the US and um, makes them less friendly to China. That is how the Chinese perceive of it. And if you ask why is China excluded, it, the membership criteria for countries to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership say, for example, that countries must commit to remove completely all state-owned enterprises well, if you know anything about the political economy of China, that is absolutely impossible. China has a massive uh, set of state-owned enterprises which are politically very powerful. And therefore, that criterion, that to be in the negotiations, you, you have to, you, the government, have to agree to give up all state-owned enterprises, that makes it impossible for China to join. However, something really interesting has happened just in the past few weeks, which is that the government of China has said that the Shanghai free trade zone will apply to join these negotiations. And other countries have said, no, wait a minute, this is an agreement between states, and the Shanghai free trade zone is not a state, so it can't join. But China is really pressing that this little part of China, the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, must be able to enter into negotiations because all the membership conditions can be met by the firms that are operating within the Shanghai Free Trade, free trade Zone. So this is a really interesting new kind of um, development that's happened. And so basically the bottom line of these trade deals that are going on, these trade negotiations, is that they strengthen, there's, there's certainly an attempt to strengthen the West's grip on gro global rules of trade and investment, um, and therefore the West's grip on power in the interests of Western corporations. Um, but all this, these negotiations, the trade negotiations, climate change negotiations, the post-millennium development goals negotiations, you have to set them in, this, in the larger context, a bigger kind of debate uh, that's happening in the world. And it's really, um, the larger context is really this. There is all this talk of an emerging new world order. That is, um, a whole lot of countries that we call developing countries or emerging market economies are kind of coming up in the world and exercising uh, political influence in a way that they did not do before. Um, and so, for example, Robert Zellick, who is president of the World Bank, um, said in 2010, we are now in a new, fast-evolving, multipolar world economy. This word, multipolar, is the key word you will have seen yourself lots of talk about the rise of the rest or the rise of the east or the rise of Asia um, even recently there's talk of rising Africa um, 
Asia catching up with the West, people also talk of the great reconvergence. Um, they talk of China emerging as a superpower. All this talk is in the air. And the other side of it is renewed talk of US decline. And so, um, to quote something said in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the paper that's just been renamed, the International New York Times, just very recently. This is from Kishore Mabubani, who's the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. Um, and he was quoted as saying, um, all over Asia, people are asking, can America manage itself? And what are the implications for us if America cannot manage itself? Um, and then there's this wonderful um, commentary from the official Chinese uh, news agency um, after the US government shut down, uh, the official agencies commented, um, this is now a good time for the befuddled world, that means a confused world, to start considering building a de-Americanized world, a de-Americanized world. And so um, the question then is, how much truth is there in this characterization of the rise of the rest or the rise of Asia. Um, so as a social scientist, the question is, what is the evidence? Um, well, one piece of evidence that has advanced to support this idea of the rise of the rest is relative growth rates. And it is true that over the 2000s, the, the middle and the low income countries have grown at some four to six percentage points faster than the high-income countries, HIC is high-income countries, and this is the first time in human history that this kind of thing has ever happened, that these much lower-income countries have grown very much faster. Although, remember that just in the past few years, we're now at the end of 2013, in 2011 and 12 and 13, the growth of these countries have slowed down a lot, but from 2000 to, say, 2010, they were growing much faster. Um, and so that there's been something of a change in which countries are in the top 10 in terms of their size of their GDPs. In 1990, it was the G7. The G7 includes the US and Canada and Britain and France and Germany and Italy and uh, Japan, yeah, and Japan, that's it, seven. Um, so it was in 1970, in 1990, it was the G7, plus Spain, plus Russia and Brazil. And then by 2010, only 20 years later, it was still the G7, that's a very important point, still the G7 in the top 10. But China was now number two, and Brazil and India towards the bottom of the top 10. So there are now three countries, um, developing countries, let's say, rather than just two 20 years before. So that's another indicator of multipolarity. Here's a chart which shows um, for both China and, Ind Ind uh, and India the, the, their share of world GDP. So you can see the rise of China very vividly. I'll just um, use um, this line. This is in market exchange rates. From 1980 through 2010, China's share of world GDP using market exchange rates went up from roughly 2% up to, let's say, 9 or 9 point something percent. So that's a very big increase in China's weight in the world. And then India, actually, this is purchasing power parity line, it, India went up, it didn't go up anything like as much as uh, China, but still India did go up. And I'm going to show you four emerging market economies in a minute, and you will be surprised to see that they did not go up. Anyway, uh, on the basis of this kind of evidence, there's been a kind of what you can call a gestalt shift, a shift in the way people see things. Um, it's analogous to the way that there has been a gestalt shift in how we see the Arctic. 
the Arctic used to be seen as a kind of a periphery, just far away. Nobody pays attention to the Arctic. But suddenly, as the Arctic ice has been melting, the, there's been a shift from the Arctic as periphery to the Arctic as a frontier. That is a frontier which has opportunities but also threats. There's a big difference in that way of seeing. And we have come to see developing countries in, that, in, in a similar kind of way. That is, there's been a similar shift in the way that developing countries are seen. That's what I mean by a gestalt shift. But the question is, how accurate is this idea of the rise of the South? Um, and I'm going to show you some evidence which suggests it's, it's quite an exaggeration. First of all, the U.S. remains by far and away the dominant economy, the dominant state. So the U.S. population is about 4.5% of the world population, and it's producing roughly 22% of world GDP, 22%, let's say between a fifth and a quarter. That's huge, coming from 4.5%. Um, secondly, the U.S. has very strong what are called positional advantages. Think, for example, of Wall Street. Wall, Wall Street dominates world finance. The U.S. dollar is by far and away the most important international currency, and that's not going to change anytime soon. And the U.S. gets big advantages from having its national currency as the international currency. If you look at the West overall, the West, that is basically North America and Western Europe, plus Australia and New Zealand, even New Zealand. I come from New Zealand, um, which has a population of about four and a half million, which is about the same as Palestine, I think. Um, so tiny country. Anyway, the West includes m more than, or accounts for more than 50% of world GDP, more than 65% of foreign direct investment, and 93% of world foreign exchange reserves, 93%. That is, the US dollar, the euro, the British pound, together account for 93% of world foreign exchange reserves. Nobody has the Brazilian currency in their foreign exchange reserves except Brazil. Um, OK, so and uh, that's, that's one set of points that suggest this idea of multipolarity, a multipolar world is an exaggeration. This is the second one, and this uses the same um, kind of measure that I showed you before for China and India, that is the share of these countries from 1980 through to 2010, the share of their GDP in world GDP. This is a measure of economic weight. Well, I mean, these charts are absolutely astonishing. Um, this is Indonesia. Indonesia, from 1980 through to 2010, is flat. It's not gone shooting up like China. This is Brazil, flat. Uh, this is Russia, flat. This is South Africa, flat. There's been no indication of them as sort of emerging markets using this particular measure. Um, so... Okay, so this is on the one hand. This is what's been happening on the economic front. And the idea of multipolarity is an economic idea. Um, and what I'm saying is that this idea, the idea that the world has become a multipolar economic world, is something of an exaggeration. Now what I want to go uh, switch to is, is the question of the political power. What has happened to the political power of developing countries such as, for example, China or India or Brazil or Indonesia, what has happened to their political power in global governance? Uh, talking, uh, disaggregating power into three components. One is simply presence, like presence at the negotiating table. Second one is or country autonomy, the ability of a c country to make autonomous choices for itself. And the third component is influence, that is ability to lead, lead an international agenda, to shape an international agenda. So let me um, give, let me give a summary of what I think has been happening in terms of the political power 
uh, in, of developing countries in global governance organizations. The question is, has there been a power shift away from the West towards developing countries or groups of developing countries? And the first point to make is that there has certainly been an increase in the inclusion of some developing countries in global governance organizations. There's no question about that, especially since the 2008 <coughs> crisis. Can, can you just remind me, when must I stop? What's the, what is the timetable? Uh, I see. Okay, so you mean that's uh, a maximum of 20 minutes? 20 minutes. Uh, well, we'll see. Okay. Okay, I want, to, I want to... So, the point I'm making is that if you look across the whole array of global governance organizations, there has been an increase in the inclusion of uh, some developing countries uh, at the top <coughs> tables and the best example of this increase in inclusion is the G20. Um, <clears throat> and since this is a very important organization, which is generally thought to be a good thing, um, I want to just uh, spend a little bit of time telling you about the G20 as, a, a, as an important innovation in global governance. So, um, in 1999, there was a terrible economic crisis out in East Asia, which spread to Russia and to much of Latin America, especially Brazil, in that is in 97 to 1999. And so in 1999, the G7 finance ministers decided to expand their group to include uh, quite a number of developing countries, to really to discuss what to do about the East Asian crisis, how to handle it, and so this became known as the G20F, stands for finance ministers. It was just finance ministers. Um, and the G20F included the G7, plus Australia was added, and then the EU was added, which was pretty strange because these are all countries and the EU is not a country. And 11 developing countries were added, and these are the developing countries that um, came together to constitute the G20 at the level of finance ministers to discuss um, issues to do with the financial aspects of the world economy. And then we had the great crash in the West in 2008, and George Bush decided to um, expand or, or upgrade the G20 at the finance ministers level to the G20 at the heads of government level, the leaders level. So this became G20L, and the G20L included the same countries, together with somehow or other Spain got invited as, quote, permanent guest. Not a member, but a permanent guest. And so this, this group of G20 countries, plus the EU, includes 85% of world GDP, 80% of world trade, two-thirds of world population, and the G20 at the leaders' level, declared itself as the main economic council of the whole world. It was the main steering committee, so to speak, for the whole world. And indeed, they said that it was the equivalent of the UN Security Council for economic and financial and development issues. Um, and what happened then was that after the crisis of 2008 sort of abated or lifted, then the G20, which was initially formed to handle the crisis, began to expand its agenda. So it began to talk about macroeconomic payments and balances. It began to talk about development. It began to talk about agriculture, food security, and so on, environment. It began to talk about the Eurozone crisis. And there then, uh, then there began to be quite a number of problems. Um, 
and the first major problem with the G20 is that it lacks what you could call input legitimacy. That is to say, it lacks representation. Because the obvious question is, how were those 11 developing countries selected? Uh, who do they represent? And the short answer is they represent nobody but themselves. And secondly, they were selected basically by the US and Germany together decided which developing countries should come into the G20 and which should not. So South Africa got invited, but Nigeria or Egypt, for example, did not get invited. Argentina got invited, but Colombia did not get invited. And this was just at the decision of the G7. So, um, and, uh, so, so it's totally lacking in any kind of representational legitimacy. And so that's the first problem. And the second problem is that it is still the G7 within the G20 which makes the basic decisions because these other developing countries, the 11 developing countries, they have no uh, history of cooperating amongst themselves, whereas the G7 have a long history of cooperating. So before each G20 meeting, the G7 meet and they decide what they want to get out of the G20, and then they just get it out of the G20 because the other, the 11 developing countries, they, they're not cooperating to form an agenda of their own. Um, so, and so for these two reasons, um, uh, in particular this one, that the G20 has no representational structure, meaning that 182 UN members, including uh, Israel, including Lebanon, including uh, Jordan, and so on, they're permanently excluded from the G20. They're not part of any representational mechanism. And so, for reasons of this kind, the, the Norwegian foreign minister said the G20 is one of the biggest setbacks to international relations since the Second World War. So this is a really strong uh, criticism uh, of the G20. The this, the, the second main uh, criticism that I'll make is that the G20 lacks output legitimacy. That is to say, it has just not been effective. It's not been able to do very much. And one main reason is because it's put more and more issues onto its agenda. And as more and more issues come onto the agenda, so the cleavages, the differences between the, the members become bigger and bigger, and they've found it very difficult to do more at their summit meetings, to do more than just make fine words, to say nice things, but not actually um, make compromises with each other which would advance um, an agenda. Um, so, um, one, one thing, uh, just to continue this point, that um, there has been an increase in the inclusion of some developing countries uh, into international organizations. To continue that point, the G20 is the best example, but also, for example, the OECD. The OECD, you will know as the club of rich industrialized countries. Um, and for a long time, the OECD has had a small development center out on the margin, um, where all the development discussions in the OECD were sort of limited to the OECD Development Center. Well, the OECD has decided now that it is going to mainstream development. So um, all the parts, all the divisions, the departments of the OECD are now going to include development, are going to be discussing issues of development uh, in whatever subject matter that they are dealing with. Well, there's an obvious problem. There are no developing countries that are members of the OECD. So to kind of um, square this circle, so to speak, to solve this problem that the OECD is now to be discussing de development issues uh, across everything it does, but there are no developing countries who are members of the OECD, to solve this problem, the OECD has brought in these developing countries, these ones, 
as what it calls key partners. Remember, Spain was brought into the G20 as a, quote, permanent guest. Well, this is another example of creative, uh, creative categories. Um, the, these countries are brought in as key partners. Um, and so if you look across many other international organizations, you can see that the, G the developing countries that are members of the G20 have been brought into the top governing bodies of these international organizations. I'm not going to talk about the um, OECD. I will say something briefly about the World Bank. Um, uh, because on the face of it, the World Bank has, has um, uh, uh, undertaken voice, what are called voice reforms, or it's mainly voting reforms. That is, it's undertaken, an undertaken a redistribution of votes, countries' votes, to shift voting share from developed to developing countries. And um, this was actually something ordered by the G20 leaders, that the World Bank must shift votes from developed to developing countries. And the G20 said the shift must be at least three percentage points. Um, and so the World Bank uh, governing body undertook very, very difficult negotiations to redistribute votes from one set of countries to another set of countries. And in 2010, the conclusion was that uh, the, uh, more than three percentage points had been shifted to developing countries. So this looks to be um, uh, part of this uh, 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 of an increase in the power of developing countries in world governance. It looks to be. But I, wrote, I published a paper in the journal World Development earlier this year where I showed that the real shift was not more than three percentage points. The real shift was 0 0.46 percentage points. In other words, the real shift was practically nothing. And there's an interesting question of how this tiny shift was presented as a significant shift. Um, but the other, th the other thing that's been happening in the World Bank that I want to draw your attention to is what, and it's been happening in many other organizations, that's the, that's the key point, is what you could call the bilateralization of the World Bank. And what that means specifically is that more than 40% of the bank's, World Bank's operational budget comes from trust funds, not from um, capital contributions which go into a common pool for the bank to decide how to use, but from um, individual countries like Japan or the US or New Zealand or Norway <coughs> making available a pot of money called a trust fund so that if uh, a project officer in the World Bank wants to do a project, a certain kind of project, it's possible to get money for that project from a country trust fund. But, of course, the country sets conditions like, okay, we will allow you to use money from our trust fund provided you do this, this, and this, and this, uh, which are in line with our objectives, and you employ our specialists. And that's what I mean by the bilateralization of the World Bank. The World Bank is a multilateral institution, but it is becoming bilateralized. That is, the, West, the, the Western countries are able to exercise increasing bilateral leverage over the World Bank. Another way to talk about this is Trojan multilateralism. You remember um, in ancient times, the Greeks gave the citizens of Troy a great big wooden horse. And this was a gift. It was a wonderful gift. And the Trojans were very happy to receive this great big wooden horse. What they didn't know was that inside the wooden horse, there were Greek soldiers who got out in the night and overthrew the defenses of Troy. So the Greeks captured 
Troy by giving a gift which turned out to be poisonous. And so you could t t call this also Trojan multilateralism. Trojan multilateralism. It's a gift. The countries give gifts with their trust funds, but they are undermining the multilateral functioning of the organization. And this is important, not just for the World Bank, but it's happening across the board. It's happening in the IMF. It's happening in the WHO, where c individual countries uh, and also private philanthropists like the Gates Foundation are giving money to the WHO f to fight diseases, but for purposes that are decided by whoever is giving the, the, the bilateral money. This is what I mean by Trojan multilateralism. So we're seeing across the board many organizations being undercut by states which have money, like the Western states, which are the rich states, um, giving money on conditions that the multilateral organization do what the donor wants them to do. And this is eroding the whole spirit, the whole principle of multilateralism. Um, and just, I'm going to uh, come to my conclusions in just a minute, but I will say something about UNTAD because one of the people that has been instrumental in getting me here to speak to you is um, Raja Khalidi. Do I pronounce his name right? Khalidi. What? Khalidi. 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 Okay. So he's a well-known figure in these parts, and he worked for UNCTAD for 30 years, and um, he's, but he's now returned here. Um, and the particular point to make is that UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, has, since it was started in 1964, being, been a kind of think tank for developing countries. It's been the UN agency where developing countries have had the most influence. And right from the beginning, but especially in recent years, the, the Western states, that is Western European and North American states, have been trying to close down UNCTAD, to close it down, or if they can't close it down, then get it to be just totally marginalized. Um, the UNCTAD has been making criticisms, I mean, serious well-founded well criticisms of the international financial system, including the policies of the US, the US Central Bank, for example. And the West, especially the US, hates to have developing countries criticizing US policy. And so they want to shut it down. If they can't shut it down, they say, you, UNCTAD, must just concentrate on um, monitoring the effects of the crisis in the West on developing countries, the effects on poverty, the effects on gender, or something like that. But you must not say anything about the causes of the crisis. Um, and th the West has been not entirely successful, but fairly successful in marginalizing UNCTAD and a whole lot of other organizations as well. I will say s just something about the BRICS, because um, you, rem you may remember that this is a set of countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, which was sort of invented as a group by Jim O'Neill at Goldman Sachs, simply because they made a nice acronym, and um, at least several of them were very big, and then you also had to put in South Africa because you had to have an African country. But basically, it was because it made a nice acronym. But these countries had nothing in common. They'd never even sat down to talk together. But then when he coined this name, the BRICS, and put them together in an acronym, suddenly they began to think, well, maybe we should meet. We should <laughs> see what we do have in common. And so they began to meet in this series of meetings. In 2010, South Africa was admitted. And since... Um, June 2009, they've had five summits, that is the heads of government of these five countries have actually met um, and they, they had a meeting, um, in, uh, the last one was March of this year, they have another one next year. And to my astonishment, something is really happening.
That is, this is not just a talk shop where they, where they say nice things to each other. They are negotiating right now, as we speak, um, a development bank, a BRICS development bank, and they're uh, negotiating right now what is called the Contingent Reserve Arrangement, CRA. The development bank is mainly to fund infrastructure, mainly infrastructure in the five countries themselves, and the Contingent Reserve Arrangement is basically a currency pool or a currency swap, so that if one of the five goes into crisis and has to borrow, it's possible for them to borrow from other BRICS rather than go to the IMF. Um, well, there are all kinds of problems, but these are really being negotiated quite seriously, and it's quite likely that it, th at the next summit of the BRICS in 2014 in Brazil, these two things will come into existence. One main reason why the BRICS countries are doing this is because um, by doing it, they actually get more leverage on, for example, the World Bank and the IMF because um, they can threaten to walk away from the bank and the IMF saying, we have our own arrangements. And uh, so it's likely that in response to these two things, that they may get, for example, increased voting shares in the World Bank and the IMF. So there are two objectives. One of them is, is, is to actually bring these things into existence, but the other kind of objective is to leverage the threat of bringing these into existence in terms of getting more influence in the existing um, organizations. So let me just... Um, Summarize. The basic point is that this talk of a new world order or the rise of the South, the decline of the West, is very much exaggerated. And the basic reason it's exaggerated is because the people who are saying these things are looking at only what has changed or is changing and not at what has not changed. In any balanced assessment, you must look, yes, at what has changed, but you must look at what has not changed. And a lot has not changed. Um, the West, the US, still is completely dominant militarily and also economically. And the West and the US are being quite successful, quite successful in protecting their grip on power in the international organizations. Um, and so the question then for developing countries is how to get together either in big in big groups like the G77 plus China, which is the grouping within the UN system, or in smaller regional groups, how to get together to concert their actions and exercise a kind of countervailing power on the power of the West until the developing countries uh, really exercise, uh, really come together to concert their actions the West is not going to give up power voluntarily. The West will do um, pretend exercises, like the one in the World Bank, shift, apparently shifting three percentage points to developing countries, but in reality shifting almost nothing. That will be the game of the West. Well, there's much more that I could say, but um, yes, I have to rapidly draw this to a close, so thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Uh, have questions, comments? Um, when, do, when, do we, when, when are we ending this? About 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, okay. I think we all feel like we've gotten a full course in one, <laughs> one hour here, which I'm impressed by, and I hope I'm going to ask for a reading list here. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, Nadine. Um, yeah, I, I think just like the students here, I've learned a lot. So. Thank you for this. Do you want, do you want, and my question uh, maybe is... May I just ask, is anybody using the simultaneous... Oh, I should ask in Arabic. Uh, is anybody using the simultaneous translation? Oh. No one is. No, I think no one is. Okay, so I don't need to use a microphone. That's why I was asking. So, I mean, I don't want to sound self-centered, but 
even that we're in Palestine and we're fighting for some kind of state sovereignty, what does it mean to fight for state sovereignty in this new emerging world order, or supposedly new? I kind of feel, given your talk, that states here don't really have really any say anymore. And if you're that late in the game, like Palestine, trying to fight for political sovereignty now, is almost meaningless or hopeless because at the end of the day you're dealing with corporate bodies that could sue you in secret tribunals. It just <laughs> sounds still very strange. I think of like military junta is like trying to rebels. So yeah, I'd just like to ask the question of what does it mean to fight for political sovereignty in this new world, in this new emerging economic order? <laughs> well, um, just let me repeat. I really know nothing about the Palestinian situation, so I can't talk about that, um, and that is a very particular kind of situation. But um, clearly, um, uh, it's it's becoming more difficult for countries individually, individually, say Thailand, for example, individually to assert sovereignty, um, in sovereignty to determine, for example. Uh, public health regulations in the face of um, real pressure coming from tobacco companies backed by the US government to um, open up imports or, or to keep imports of cigarettes free um, even though the Thai government wishes to restrict those imports or for the government of, I don't know, Mexico to restrict US um, uh, tuna fishing within Mexican waters because it wishes to protect tuna stocks. If developing country governments are dealing with the US or with the EU on their own, there will be no, I mean, there will be very limited sovereignty <coughs> when, whenever the sovereignty issues would curb the profits of the corporations based in those entities. But the key it to protect sovereignty <coughs> is for countries, developing countries, to get together so that they're not able to be isolated in bilateral bargaining between the US and Thailand or the US and Mexico, for example. If there are groups of countries that are trying to um, insist, for example, that there <coughs> not be investor state uh, arbitration, compulsory investor state arbitration built into these trade agreements, um, then it's possible to shift the rules within the trade agreements, but it'll only happen with concerted action. And the one problem is that there's been so little concerted action by developing countries. Um, you know, the, the big one is China. But um, while China is very big in the sense that it's the second biggest economy in the world, China is also a very poor country. I mean, this is often forgotten with all the talk about China as the next superpower. China's per capita income is about 75th in the world, <coughs> 75th. I mean, it's a very poor country. India is very much poorer than China. but um, So China is not a kind of country with... Uh, one, a big, very big GDP, and two, a pretty high level of per capita income. China is very anxious, very um, inward-looking in a sense, very concerned with its own development. It's not concerned to lead a group of developing countries. It's been doing very little of that. It's too focused in on its own rise up the economic hierarchy. So. Your, your basic point, I think, is, is correct, that um, sovereignty is um, under threat, but um, developing and, and will be under threat for individual developing countries if they're, if they're not cooperating with others. Then the question is how to get that cooperation. It's an inter I don't know if any of you are concerned with dissertation topics or research topics, but... It is an interesting question. For example, take the group of 77, it's called the G77 plus China, which is the group of developing countries in the UN system that bargains with the, the developed countries. Take that grouping and 
look at what they've done over time, they have been extremely weak, this is my impression, and very easily split by the developed countries. And the more the developed countries split them, uh, then the better the developed countries hang on to power in the organizations. The question then is, how could the G77 or some new grouping become more powerful in their negotiations with the developed countries? Uh, yes. I have two uh, questions, one local and one global. Uh, first, the global, uh, we see that China is uh, developing uh, in, in high speed uh, development or high growth. Uh, and we know that most of the trade between China and other countries, now wherever you look, you'll find Chinese products, even uh, mm -hmm. in food. Uh, all this trade with China, with Euro, with the uh, dollar. And now we have uh, the power of uh, Chinese, what we call Chinese dollar. Chinese dollar. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they are you they are uh, exporting their products in, 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 in US dollar, not in their uh, country mm -hmm. uh, currency. Uh, what will affect in the future? Uh, we have two, two big uh, economy, which is China with US dollar reserves, and US, which is now declining in, their, in its power, and uh, with the decline of the currency of, you, of, of, of the dollar. This is one side. Uh, European countries, or the Euro, now uh, it is not uh, with the strength as it starts when, when they have the European Union and uh, Euro uh, among all countries. Uh, the local one is, uh, we see the uh, support or what the, the donations which comes to the, uh, we look for the sovereignty, local sovereignty, uh, that USAID or Europe, when they give donations or give support to Palestinian economy, it is uh, put under, and it's conditional. It is like uh, keeping you alive. It is not to make you develop and start your uh, economy to depend on yourself. Mm -hmm. Just they give you uh, condition uh, support. So uh, as, as I say, it's keep you alive, not mm -hmm. to build uh, industry or mm -hmm. build uh, agricultural uh, mm -hmm. uh, development or build anything. Just uh, keep you alive. Mm -hmm. How this will affect uh, the Palestinian economy to develop and have a growth in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, um, on, on your second question, I think I better um, repeat that I, um, I find the Palestinian uh, situation, as I understand it, just beyond words, horrible. And um, uh, the short answer is I just don't know. Um, in order to have any I, sense of the future prospects, I would want to know more about, for example, what happened to uh, World Bank projects in, um, in, uh, in Palestine, the extent to which uh, those projects were able to be independent of um, Israeli control. I just don't know these kind of things, probably very little. Um, I just, uh, I, I have only been here, what, uh, well, basically one day, but I keep asking myself how it is that um, the Israelis have managed to, to basically get, I mean, the tiny state of Israel has managed to get the mighty state of the United States to be so one-sided in its whole approach to this region. I, I'm just baffled by that question. Anyway, I better not say anything more about um, that. Uh, on, the, on, the, on your first point, um, you talked about the relationship between China and the U.S., but you did suggest that the U.S. is a declining power. Uh, I would question that. I mean, I know that that is being said, the U.S. is declining, but frankly, um, I, I think it would be a big exaggeration. It's the crisis which is 
it faces, it makes the, 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 the US dollar of course, uh, value, uh, of course, the U.S. dollar, but the currencies go up and down. Um, the U.S. has, uh, for, for all its political problems, and they are very big political problems of paralysis, um, the U.S. has a very, very powerful innovation machine that is a, a, a set of institutions which are by far and away the most powerful uh, set of in institutions for producing uh, technological, economic, financial innovations in the world. And, you know, that doesn't disappear, that doesn't erode just quickly. Um, no other country comes close, least of all Britain, for example. So I would really question this idea that the US is um, a de declining power. Um, and just to, uh, r just to elaborate that a little bit, I, I am a I'm astonished at what the U.S. is doing vis-a-vis -vis China because uh, the U.S. Is, is not just negotiating this trade deal with many East Asian countries which are surrounding China and excluding China, uh, as I said, but it has this great military cordon around China. It's got the seventh fleet out in the Pacific. And by the way, you may, if you're old enough, remember that the U.S. had a huge naval base in the Philippines called Subic Bay, which was then um, re required to leave by, I can't now remember, maybe it was Marcos, gov at a certain point in the Marcos government. So the U.S. pulled out of the naval base at Subic Bay. Now the U.S. is coming back to Subic Bay in a, with a big naval presence, but it's not, it's the, the name of the bay is being changed. So it will not be the U.S. is coming back to Subic Bay. It's coming back to the same place, but the place now has a different name. So it won't look <coughs> bad, so to speak. Um, but the U.S. also has a naval base in Singapore, but it's not called a, a base. And the reason is because for it to be called a base, the, it has to have permanent personnel, that is, U.S. naval personnel permanently stationed there. And the Singapore government does not want the world to know that Singapore has a, naval, a U.S. naval base. And therefore, the Singapore government says to the U.S. Navy, you must rotate the personnel fast enough so that it's not called a base. But it is a base. Um, the U.S. has these marines now stationed in Australia and so on and so on, all around China. Um, and the Chinese are getting very, very... Um, anxious about it. But the point is that this is another example of the reassertion of U.S. power, in this case to contain China. You remember I said at the beginning, across many domains of international action, the U.S. is becoming much more assertive. Uh, we are number one, despite all its foreign policy um, failures. So, um, and I certainly don't think that if you go out, say, 20 years from now, I don't think that the Chinese renminbi, for example, will in any way displace the dollar as the main international currency. I don't think the euro will. I'm, not, I'm by no means confident the euro will survive in anything like its current form. Um, so the US dollar is likely to remain the dominant currency for a long time. And as I said, having the international currency as your national currency gives the U.S. huge advantages. I mean, when Korea went into crisis, needed an emergency loan in 2008 because of the crisis, um, it didn't go to um, uh, the IMF. It didn't go to the Asian monetary arrangement, which it had helped to create. It went directly to the U.S. Federal Reserve and got the loan directly from, from them. And that's another indication of US power. So that's not quite the answer to your question, but. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for giving the lecture. It was such a helpful lecture. My question is that, uh, since like, we all know that uh, China now is a semi-peripheral country, so it's either moving towards being a poor country or going back to being a peripheral country again. 
But we all know that China is trying to adopt some Western ideas like free market economy, or or at least like giving it out to some uh, poor countries. So the West seems like the West seems to care a lot about what China is doing. So, but what you're saying is that it's an exaggerating argument. So, like, what's the other side of what you were saying? So you said that like focusing on China is such an exaggerating point of saying that China is moving. Uh, well, the idea that up. China is the emerging superpower, I'm saying that that is a big um, exaggeration. And another important point to make, which is quite relevant to this part of the world, is that China's rise, um, yes, on the one hand, it is benefiting quite a number of commodity exporting economies in Africa, in Latin America, for example, because of China's huge demand for commodities. So they're benefiting. But China's rise is also hurting many developing countries, especially in terms of their manufacturing. That is, um, China's rise and its ab ability to produce um, products for export, which are uh, low-wage product, but also high-wage product, uh, quite sophisticated products, means that it's very difficult for many countries to even stay within the low-wage sectors, um, let alone move up the product hierarchy. A, a, an example is Brazil. Um, until maybe uh, five years ago, most of the costumes used in Brazil's famous carnival festival, you know, when people uh, dress up in very elaborate costumes and go parade up and down and make music and drink and so on and so on. Most of those costumes were made by the Brazilian textile industry. Now, they're not. Almost all of the costumes used for carnival in Brazil are made in China. Um, and, that, and so the, the point is that the Brazilian textile industry, clothing industry, is being wiped out by Chinese imports. And this is happening in many other sectors. Just another, even more dramatic example, Mali. Mali is a small landlocked country. Well, actually, it's very large in terms of area, but it's small in population, in central, uh, in West Africa a landlocked country in West Africa. Until about 10 years ago, there were carpenters in the capital city who made doors and furniture for public buildings, offices, government offices in the capital of Mali. And then about 10 years ago, these carpenters found that they were being outcompeted by Chinese makers of doors in China who made plywood doors and furniture, put them onto ships, sent the ships around the Horn of Africa, up to Senegal, put the items on a train, and sent the train a thousand kilometers to the capital of Mali, and they could land those items of doors and furniture cheaper than Malian carpenters could make them. And so the Malian carpenters lost business. Uh, that is another very dramatic example of how the rise of China can actually hurt many developing countries. This is a point you will never see made by, um, you know, in, in official development circles where there's this idea that the rise of China is benefiting developing countries. But actually, you know, it, and that, this, is, this makes the rise of the BRICS even more amazing because as between Brazil and China, for example, there are huge conflicts over trade issues of the kind that I just elaborated. And the question is how the BRICS are managing to just focus on things that they can agree on and not focus on the things that they disagree on. And just while I'm speaking, I just do want to draw your attention to one of my favorite cartoons, because this this can be the, uh, a flow diagram of the international uh, economic and financial governance system. And the product here is, is a stable and growing world economy. And so 
all these interactions come together to produce the product, except that in between the interactions and the product, the stable growing world economy, you need this box, which is to say you need a miracle. Uh, let me take uh, Dr. Mohammed's question as the last question. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for your frequent and very informative uh, talk. But I would like really to to, to differ with you on certain points. Mm -hmm. uh, first, your talk expresses uh, in a very clear way that the United States. Empire is is there to stay. History tells us that empires they don't remain. You know? Throughout history, I don't want to touch on the question of history, but let me talk about you mentioned the military aspect. The military aspect, the United States could not even defeat little Taliban. And it is now asking Taliban Please come and join the government. Mm -hmm. And I don't buy it in any way, which I, then I agree with you, that the United States is going to pick a fight with the China. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you run away from Afghanistan, you're not going to pick a fight, a fight with the giant. Now, so in, 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 in military, military aspect, it is very clear that there is a crack that there is that there is a retreat in the ability of this uh, military power or empire. I come to the economics. I think we all live in the in the, in the same globe, and we know the figures, and it's clear. You mentioned that uh, China. Uh, and the international inst uh, institutions are there, and you are subtly suggesting that if you want to develop, go and make the change there. So we have to take it for granted what <coughs> international institutions are there, and we have to accept that. And you mentioned that the BRICS, including China, they are not doing really anything you know, tangible about it. And you mentioned the dollar. I cannot accept the, the, the idea that the United States, from the economic point of view, with 17, 17 a trillion dollars at its debt, in addition to the large amount of dollars which are just you know, printed out, I cannot accept that this country is a match from the economic point of view, to China, which has $3.3 trillion as reserves, and gets every year as surplus, which is really the deficit of the USA with China, which is on average $350 billion every year. So I, 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 and you, you mentioned the question of the dollar. The, and the UN. It is a fact that the West is asking China, please, please put, you know, your your UN currency and, and let it be internationalized. But it is China's choice because of economic reason, it doesn't want it. And I think also you you compare between the the, the rich. United States and the poor, relatively, the poor China. Well, the United States has to feed only 316 million. Of course, for Palestine, this is a large number. But to feed, you, you get the United States to feed 1.3 billion of the world out of 7 billion, and let us see what will be the result. And therefore, I don't accept the base that the world is static and there is no change in it. And I, I, I do see that China you already, you, it's not only money which is complaining about, you know, uh, 
about China. China. Even here yeah. in, our, in Palestine and Hebron, we are complaining yeah. about the leather and other. And therefore, those giants, you know, when giants rise or quarrel, the grass suffers. And this is, this is what it is. This is what's go going on. We suffer. Mali suffers. But there is a rising giant which you cannot really uh, underestimate the value of China. And uh, for me, China is the rising power. And history tells us that uh, the United States will not remain on the top of the world, neither economic nor political. I think. This is my point of view, anyway. Thank you. Um, before you respond, let me just say that uh, I think you will be joining uh, him on the trip to the Abu Jihad Museum and for lunch, right? So perhaps you can take into account in your response that you will have a longer conversation <laughs> a little bit later this afternoon. I actually have a 2 o'clock class. I have to go meet it. Um, but uh, why don't you go ahead and give your response, and Nadim, can you just? Um, I just want to hear the response. Go ahead. Like yeah. The yeah, that's fine. I just wanted if there's anyone in the class who might want to. Professor Wade, you want to continue answer the yeah, question? Yeah, no, continue. Go ahead and answer the uh, question. We're applauding for Mehreen's exit. Don't worry. Sorry? Uh, we're applauding Mehreen's exit. Oh, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Well, look, I, I, the main point is, is to correct the summary you gave of my talk. You gave the summary as me saying the world is static, there is no change. Uh, I was not saying that. Um, I said that the change that is commonly talked about uh, as the emerging world order is, is, is an exaggerated change and it's exaggerated because people are focusing only on what has changed or is changing and not has on what has not changed. And that's an important distinction. Um, the second main point to make is that the, China's rise is indeed very important. It is, it is changing things, but the, it, is, it is the only case, it is the only country that is really changing the way the world economy works. In other words, there's not a general rise of many developing countries. The idea of multipolarity implies that many developing countries have substantially gained economic weight. And that's what I want to challenge. But the rise of China, that is real. But remember, China is a very poor country. It is, as I said, this is really important to remember. It has got the second biggest GDP in the world, next to the US, yes. Although, remember, too, that its GDP is much lower as a share of world GDP than the US. The US share is about 22%, China's is about 9 So there's a huge difference between 22 and 9 That's the first point. The second point is that China's per capita income is about number 75th in the world. I mean, it is way down. So China is in some ways a very poor country, even though it has also got a very advanced set of industries like that can put satellites up and so on. So, all these things are true. You have to have both things in your mind uh, as true. It's not one or the other. It's not that the world is not changing. It's not that the world, that we are entering a whole new world economy. Neither of those is true. Okay. Thank you, and nice. please join me in the program. And we would like to offer Professor Wade a little gift. Another one. Okay. Another one, you know, it's just a, it's, from, <laughs> it's a gift economy over here, so you, <laughs> you, you. This is from the you, university. Oh, we, thank you. I mean, again, thank we you. welcome you here into the whole region. It's your first time here. And thank you, that's very